Everybody, welcome. Thanks for coming. Uh, we're close to Christmas, so this is great to have you here. Um, so my name is Abuey Ramos Fermi. I'm one of the artists involved in this series of exhibitions uh, that has been running since September. But this slot here is from the month of, from the, the month of uh, December. Uh, it's created actually by Chad Stero, right there, from the Bronx River Art Center. Uh, so this use of exhibitions is basically an exploration of the community and, and art and social practice engagement. So just in a nutshell, um, I've collaborated with Elizabeth Hamby, which is right here. Uh, Joe Q. Nelson is there and other three collaborators um, who will be here tonight, uh, Action Club. And we created a space um, that is right there the, on, on that side of the room, uh, inspired by Casa Amadeo, um, most of you know that, uh, I think I should have, you don't need an explanation for Casa Madero, right? Okay, so, <laughs> um, so basically Casa is just, you know, one of the most important record shops in New York City, and I'm just going to leave it there, because we have very important panelists here that can talk about that. So, um, very informal atmosphere, we're going to have uh, Villa Guaro, who's going to be uh, moderating the whole panel, um, and if you introduce everybody, um, and basically, everyone's going to get a couple of minutes to present, and we're going to open up the floor for questions. So feel free at any time. If you have any questions or comments, to just participate. That's that's what you know this is all about. So with further ado, thank you. Uh, uh, is the curator from Bronx. Uh, I don't know. I think. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm Chad, I'm the curator of Arts Art Center, um, and I don't think I have to add anything, I was, or hopefully I pretty much said it all. Uh, thank you all so much for coming, and thank you, Ajway and Elizabeth, for putting this together. This is really fantastic, and this is exactly what the Shifted Communities Exhibition Series was designed to support, so I'm really happy to see this going on. So. Thank you very much. My name is Bill Aguado, I work at the Bronx Music Heritage uh, Center, which is a concept that will become a reality in a few years. And the purpose is just exactly what we're doing here today, to record, to document the history of uh, Latin music in the South Bronx, hip hop music, indie rock, R&B, gospel music, you name it. But because of my friends here, I decided that it was important that, and since Latin jazz and the South Bronx are one and the same, and Known throughout the world that, uh, that the Bronx, the South Bronx, is the home of Latin jazz. And as someone who has been to a lot of the clubs from the 60s, early 60s to recent, I can attest to its power, to its rhythms, to its contribution to the community. The Bronx Music Heritage Center is going to be a 300 unit apartment. Uh, subsidized housing in which 10 to 20 percent is going to be a set aside for all the musicians as a live work. There's going to be a Bronx Music Heritage Center itself, which I'm helping to develop with uh, my team of Angel and Aaron Burns May, that uh, will have a 6,000 square foot uh, center, uh, a performance space, rehearsal space, recording space, and what have you. Attached to the building itself, will be a school uh, from uh, middle school to high school by far college and it will focus on El Sistema, the music system that's being done in Venezuela. And for those of you who may have heard about it, it's the Simon Bolivar uh, music program. And we had it recently at Casita Maria, the, the Simon Bolivar El Sistema Latin Jazz Group, which was a fabulous uh, experience. Let me just let me just introduce my panelists and my friends. And I've known some of these people for too too long. Uh, Angel Angel Rodriguez and Bobby Sinatra. By the way, I was at the Bronx Council of the Arts in '79. The first person I booked for. The Bronx Council of the Arts was Bobby, yeah. and we yeah. played the parts I had. Learn something new every day. Michael Max, <laughs> Bobby, the executive of Bronxnet, Al Quinones uh, with his crew at 52 Park, did a major miracle. Elena Martinez, 
entertainers who have been one of our most important ethnomusicologists, documentarians that were not let the United Jazz Experience fall by the wayside. And the format is, think of this as a dinner. We finish the evening, we're sitting around the table, we're trying to finish up our last drinks, and we're talking about growing up, our experience with the music in the South Bronx. And everybody has an opinion. I wouldn't say that Bobby is shy. They certainly wouldn't say that Al is shy. They certainly wouldn't say that Angel is shy. None of you are shy. Basically, what I'm hoping for that we would establish today is a, a discussion, a dialogue about your experience when you first started with the Latin jazz. And for many of us, it wasn't Latin jazz, it was black music. For many of us, we go far enough back, but it wasn't salsa, it was a mambo. And to this day, I put salsa on my chips, and I dance the mambo. I've never seen anyone dance the salsa. So I basically, again, to bring everybody together and talk about what was then, what was the experience, and what is now. And what is the future? Now, we have a wonderful legacy that we're, we're hoping to record as part of our group of Galaxy Simpson. But equally important is that each of the individuals here carry their own significant legacies that are going to be part of our history in the Bronx. And I wouldn't mention a certain name, but who told me, why don't you have the real stars come and talk? Why, well, yeah, these are the stars who may not be the real super headliners, but these are the ones who made a difference. They're not, they're not the Tito Puentes, they're not the Mongo Santa Maria's. They are who they are, and they made significant contributions to the Bronx, to Latin jazz, to our culture, and most importantly, to our neighborhoods. So let me start off on my right with Angel and give him a few minutes to just talk about, you know, some of the stories, some of the things that we we had when we spoke about this afternoon. 1965, maybe 65. I come from uh, from Puerto Rico to. Uh, at the Simpson Street, 57, and, and I mean, I live in, in a lot of places, uh, not out of want, but out of necessity, you know. Uh, we broke a lot of leases, as I said, mm -hmm. my mom and the kids. Now, I'm coming into New York from a farm where I already had experience at Gran Combo on television because my aunt had bought the first TV up in the mountain. And I, I would hide under the house and I'd go to church and get beatings for that in order to watch it. Now, I was kind of, you know, already I had the bug. But once I got to New York, um, what I came into it was a very dysfunctional South Bronx life that came. And I can get into horror stories and, and different things about it, but it doesn't really matter. What mattered was that I found drums. And then I found a group of people in the park, in the streets of New York City, that later became to be known as the Roombas of New York, right? And the, the one that we all know is the Central Park, Roombas. But that zone there, that was a safety zone. And that's where I started to really get into uh, the drum itself, but not knowing names of rhythm, not knowing what the hell I was playing. Because in, in La Roomba, Everybody's in the rumba. It's a place where the poor people will go. You don't have to pay no club or nothing. You can sing, dance, and play, and then have a great time. But among those people, you have some developments too. But here I am, I'm a kid. I'm in there. I'm learning, learning, learning. Uh, until, um, you know, I got to a point where I said, wow, you know, I'm playing all this stuff, and I don't know what I need to do with it. And my, my, my first teacher was Frank in my life. And he schooled me, and what's going on? Just boom, boom, boom. So, to go forward, my first band, Latin band, playing the Cuchifrito scene, 
and it was a real popular club on, on Tremont, the Southern Boulevard called El Paraíso, and it was a, it was a former uh, it was a former topless bar. So the, the bar was around the, the stage and with the poles, and so we were in the middle of the bar playing music. And my first uh, uh, Latin jazz music that I really experienced that I and, I, and of course at that time I didn't characterize it as Latin jazz, but because there was no singing in the tune and it was just wonderful, and the improvisation of the, the horns and all that stuff was really so great, it was Pitalillo. And that, man, that, oh my God. You know, and that, that just took me to another place, another level where I, I really wanted to uh, get into, uh, you know, learning more about this, this Latin and these jazz elements coming together. Um, so that was my, you know, my first experience in a, in a band and playing my first Latin jazz music. Let's be What about, show us some of the... Oh, this, uh, yeah, well, this, no, this stuff I started to listen to once I started to play with the band. <coughs> this is something from my collection, I, uh, you know, that I still play, I still have my Fisher amp, and the house still works, mm -hmm. you know, and I still have my, my turntable and stuff, and, and I play this. You know, Mojo Santa Maria, you know, I was, I was at the Yankee Stadium, the big old concert, I rushed the stage, and. Nicky Marrero telling me that he's staying with the sticks only in his hands. <laughs> Everything else is gone. Uh, Tito Puente, Mania. And this is a, a different year. I think this is a, a, the first one. Well, uh, no, that's the first one. This is the first one? Okay, this is the second one. Uh, Cal Jada with Momo Santa Maria. You know, and, and here's all this Latin chat. This is, this is what was really uh, great stuff. Machito and his uh, Afro Cuban Orchestra. Happy holiday, by the way. Happy holiday to you guys. <laughs> Did you say that that was a nice drink? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. I didn't say that. This is a young lady that was. She came up to us. He, he ordered vodka, I ordered Jack Daniels. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Anyway. Cal Jay and Eddie Palmieri and Sonido Nuevo. Wow. What a combination. What music. You know, it, 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 and it still excites me. And, and you see the energy, the adrenaline starts to flow, even talking about this stuff, you know. Uh, Mondo Santa Maria, of course, explodes at the village gate, you know, really great stuff. South Sauce, Cal Jada, and of course, Shearing. George Shearing, who has Armando Peraza, on Bangos and Mongas, uh, recorded uh, the tune Caravan. Uh, written, I mean, yeah, we can talk, we talk about Latin jazz, but you go online and find out the history, right? We, we hear on a more personal basis. Did we just finish dinner, like you said? And where, where's that wine? Yeah, <laughs> where's that name? <laughs> Tell us about 1994 at the point and what you started there. Well, that, that was a, um, you know, I, I was telling, uh, you know the story Bill. about uh, Bill, <laughs> not, not Kathleen. <laughs> um, um, I was, I was telling you a story about Ruby D and Ozzy Davis you know, doing the show. So I asked him, I said, you know, 45 years of marriage, Hollywood celebrities, you know, how do you do it all? He said, and his answer to me was, we do greater things than ourselves. So in 1994, I, I guess playing the salsa scene with Paquito Guzman or, you know, Lalo Sobrini and stuff like that, you know, Richie Gonzalez. And you know, the, 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 the cantante Roberto Roena, I was doing all this stuff, but it just, to me, it wasn't enough. And I needed to come out from behind the drum and do something more. And, and that new phrase, that answer that that man gave me, honestly, I gave me like really, really, you know. And I, and, and I bumped into uh, Mildred Grease, Stephen Sapp, who are married now and have good requests, uh, Maria Torres, and Paul Lipson, my Judino. Right? And Paul said, here they got all these ideas and all this stuff, and oh, we're going to open the center, and they're going to share a cheap young people with all these ideas, and, and, and being in this business, you get a lot of people talking to you with a lot of stuff and everything, so then a year later, we got, the, we got the space. I was like, oh my God. So yeah, I got to the point, I fell in love with the space, I started a, a free program for kids, no, no one paid, no one paid. 
I got a couple of teachers coming in, you know, boom, boom, and we just taught kids. Free of charge, free of charge. I put in every instrument that I had in my closet and in my storage, and then um, a lot of that stuff was broken down and stuff. I don't have half of it anymore, but I didn't care. You know, and there's something that I wanted to do, and, and so besides, you know, I think as young musicians, we chase the glamour, the glory, the fame, and, and you know, the money, whatever we do, but I, those are the things that weren't important to me anymore. Chasing those dreams that might not even come true, you know, and we can get into some other area about young people and the generations that are coming up with musicians, how Bobby educates them, you know, academia, a backup system, you know, that, that you can fall back on because the music business is so unstable. So, but the point was that it was a really, really great place for me to uh, 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 just, uh, you know, expand in general my artistic ways, you know, and use what I had uh, to, to uh, 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 benefit the community in some kind of way or another. And, and it is what it is, you know, I live by the moment. Here we are on this, this panel. I'm so glad to be among these scholars and, and people in the audience like Benny Bonilla, you know, one of the master percussionists. Mm -hmm. just, just to have you in the audience is really great, bro, you know. <laughs> I love you a lot. So, so the point, you know, the point of the is the is still there, you know, and the, the whole recession thing is still over, and then I was in a whole other new generation of young folks there that I, when I walk in the place, they don't know who I am. But it doesn't matter because I just get a kick out of the world of motion and the city here hanging around and stuff like that. So my, my experience with the point was, was great. My tenure there was really great. And uh, after that, it was UMass at Amherst, Massachusetts. You know, that's a whole other stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hold on. That's what I'm talking about. Don't miss it. That's a lobster. Let's miss it. People pouring water in my glass. Apple sandwich, sir. Thanks. Thank you. Bobby, let me turn to you. I, when, I first, when, when I first met Bobby, uh, some would say 30 years ago, over 30 years ago, uh, I would say my case about 90 pounds ago, and in Bobby's case about well, 90 pounds ago. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't get old enough to carry all these drums, you know, it was skinny. But Bobby's been one of the mainstays in Latin jazz, one of the strongest political and ad cultural advocates for Latin jazz with the Grammys who dropped Latin jazz as a as, 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 as a category, but also what he's done as an educator, and yet he remains to be one of the one of one of the best percussionists out there. He maintains the standard both as a, as a professional musician, but also as a major contributor as a person to our community. So, Bobby, it's all yours. You never had. I could never shut Bobby up anyway. <laughs> you might want to have to, have to say, but anyway, it's an honor to be here. Thank you, Bill, for having us on this panel. Thank you for, for coming here today. I know you could have been at home watching the Sci-Fi Channel or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but let me give you a little bit of perspective. I grew up around here, so um, I tend to write, uh, I've been a, I was a group that uh, called the Latin Jazz, uh, yahoogroups.com, and I've been on today for about 10 years, and, it's made up of musicians, lay people, uh, some producers, DJs, etc., radio, uh, radio people. And we, block, we, we talk about the music. Somebody was having a discussion about what, what, what New York was like. I grew up in a special time period in New York from 1963 to 1973. <clears throat> New York had the highest crime rate of any major city in, in the history of the United States. That crime rate has never been toppled in terms of uh, statistics from that time period. It's studied in colleges, universities, that, where you study law, forensics, et cetera, et cetera, crime, law, ex you know, it, it was a pretty incredible time period. Uh, and I grew up in that time period, here in the South Bronx, which was the symbol of urban decay. So somebody was talking about how New York was, and, and I was like watching, reading the, the, the book back and forth. So at, uh, at, uh, what is this, 6.05 in the morning, on um, November 2nd, 2002, I wrote down my thoughts and put them on this blog. So bear with me. Uh, and you'll see where I'm coming from as a musician, because everything that I do as a musician and as an educator is informed by this neighborhood. Everything. Everything. You know, I've traveled all over the world. 
I've spoken at the Aspen Ideas Felt the first. I've, I've had lunch with Madeline Albright. I mean, but everything I do is informed from, is, is inspired by this neighborhood. Uh, anybody from New York City remember Flo Shine Shoes on East 149th Street and 3rd Avenue in Sobro, the South Bronx? They had the latest Playboys. These shoes were the rage in New York City, but only made it to Philly with transplanted New Yorkers. Those were the days. Playboys had this crepe sole that was thick. The perfect shoe to withstand New York City pavement and still look righteous. They were expensive for the day, usually starting at around $14.95 when they first came out, all the way up to $65 by the time they went out of style. They were worn by pimps, pushers, hustlers, and young bloods who wanted to style to the max. That meant Boriguas and brothers. Ah yes, and the ever-present mock turtleneck with an alpaca sweater and color-coordinated shark skin pants that made the young player of the, the, of the day look like a hip ghetto version of Andy Williams, Perry Como, or Patato. If you didn't dig your hair, you usually wore a beaver lid. Standard attire for the Joe Batan crowd at Taft High School of Andrew Charles, Samuel Gompers, D. with Clinton, and Carla Hayes when you left the school. Afro so big that you could hide your homework, pens, pencils, and of course other things in there. And then there were the last remnants of the Italian street festival on Morris Avenue in the South Bronx, which used to be all Italian at the end of the Melrose projects. Then came platforms, and then marshmallow shoes. If you ran track in high school like I did, you started using Adidas and or Nike cross country track shoes instead of Cons, Pro Kids, or cheapy Beta Bullet sneakers with our jeans, which we would modify like a Khalifa modifies a car to make it into a low rider. <laughs> then Clyde's by Puma, voila, the birth of the designer sneaker, straight from the ghetto. The ghetto brothers, the Southern Immortals, the Black Spades, the Golden Guineas, amongst others, were the last remnants of the street gang culture of the 50s. The seven immortals were seven guys who were all less than five foot inches tall. Locos de Madre, or CMFs. CMFs, for those of you who don't know, street pounds are, is short for crazy motherfuckers. <laughs> the, language of the, the language of the day. I'm booking. Got a tip. Tipulate. Tipulate. Smell you later. He's breaking wild. Ofi, which means oficial. Nice kicks. Solid. They're only not 110. Righteous. We yo! This was an ad campaign slogan that AMP supermarkets did on TV. Everyone used it on the basketball court when they shamed you by sinking a long shot, yelling, We yo! <laughs> Fuck you, Magoo. <laughs> hey, Mo, this is my associate. The horizontal mambo, which meant sex. High water hue, a put down if you had pants that didn't touch your ankles and showed them. Next, the short version of I got next if you play basketball. Quien se tiró el marco, rompe culos, very small plantings. He's a J-A-M-F, jamf, which means jive-ass motherfucker. <laughs> I dig, I don't dig, crazy, you dig, dig you now, bury you later. She's a freak, shaking hands with shorty, which means taking a piss. My man is a slush pumper, that means he plays trombone. Slow drag, slow dancing really close. Brooklyn slow drag, slow dancing with a girl against the wall. The 500, slow dragging while you have your knees bent. The 1000, slow dragging while you have your knees bent so you're almost touching the floor. Kunga, how our African American brothers pronounce Konga. Bana, Loisaida, Loisa. Broski, Redski, Lefkowitz. My funds are low, which means you're broke you, you're, or you're cheap. No doubt, he's out. It's easier to talk shit than to do shit. The sound of two Chinese Cubans in a restaurant cursing each other out in Spanish, English, and who knows, Cantonese, Mandarin, I don't know, multi multiculturalism at its best. The above ground portable swimming pools at the city built in the basketball courts of the projects in order to calm the natives who were getting restless in the summer. The only problem was that they became huge sanitation repositories at night, fueled by the anger of brothers who had lost their beloved basketball courts. City planning? No, stupidity at its best. The Johnny Pump was the real deal. Making out on the roof of the projects. Making love anywhere, at any cost, when no one was looking. Black light posters and lava lamps. If you didn't have that, you bought a red light bulb at the hardware store. Stepping over, nodding off chunkies in the morning when you ran down the stairs of the projects to get to school on time. The aroma of ghetto sheep, urine in the halls. The old school player's best grooming friend, club man. Wearing a, work, wearing a woman's stocking cap. You stock it as a skull cap on your head at night when you went to bed if you had fellow model bad hair. 
the sound of footsteps in your heartbeat racing because you wound up in somebody else's neighborhood and you hurt her whole ass because you were being chased. Stick ball, box ball, Chinese box ball to some. Off the point, stoop ball to others, scalesies, double dutch, whist, kagao, one on one, Johnny on the point, suicide, punch ball, softball, touch football, war, etc. Street games that are vivid memories of developed hand and eye coordination, imagination, and camaraderie. And in some cases, when there was a dispute, diplomacy, and or fighting skills to the max. And then there was the game that was a test of creativity, imagination, humor, and cojones. The precursor to rocking the mic. It was called Oh Yeah. Two people facing each other head on, a crowd chanting Oh Yeah four times in a melodic, in a melodic case while they slapped, while they clapped on beats two and four, simulating a basic conga tumba. Then the first battler, the chancellor and the challenger would exclaim a name, think, place, or object. For example, it's Julius Caesar. The crowd would chant, oh yeah, once. The other battler would then have to instantaneously respond with something that rhymed. The titty squeezer. The crowd group would respond with, oh yeah, and the chanter would say maybe, it's Bob Hope. Oh yeah. The battler would respond with, he's taking dope. Oh yeah. It's Lola Slate. Oh yeah. She is a pain. Oh yeah. She got a plan. Oh yeah. With Superman. Oh, if the battler could not respond, the, intro, the original chant of Oh Yeah would be repeated four times and a new battler would step up until somebody would come up with a rhyme, or until the story in question came to a logical conclusion. Spontaneous creativity? Hell yeah. You could also play the game solo with chorus and just tell the story yourself, which is what most of us did. Call it what you will, it was the jazz of the streets. It was our form, it was our form of urban decima. Fights were less common. You had to be really pissed off to get to that point. The intellectual art of the put down was raised to levels never before attained because everybody in the neighborhood each, knew each other's moms. And they all talked. You didn't want to fight a friend or acquaintance because then the parents would get involved. The worst thing would be if a cop brought you to your mom because they caught you doing something wrong. You'd beg, please, officer, no. You see, it was embarrassing because everyone in the neighborhood would see you walking with it. And so the dozens, the ancient art form that was born during the slave period in the US from African American culture that combines prose, poetry, spontaneity, wit, humor, and pathos was in full effect if you had a dispute with someone. A typical exchange. I went to your mom, I went to your house, I opened the refrigerator and saw a dead coach. Your mother yelled out, say me the white meat. <laughs> person would respond, they had to respond, oh yeah, well your mother's like a bowling ball, always getting fingered, always in the gutter, and always coming back for more. <laughs> it became a Roman spectacle with crowds chanting each other, each combatant on, two gladiators, male or female, facing each other in the best sense of the word. Using the word to engage hate, anger, jealousy, respect, disrespect in a human drama, to gain respect from each other, their peers, their community, in a life and death struggle that leave the winner a champion and the loser humiliated. Shakespeare was always in the house because his art form was alive in this battle of wits that could be as dramatic as Hamlet, funny as two gentlemen of Verona, or as tragic as Romeo and Juliet. Tecatos, junkies, air tromboning, Willie Colon or Barry Rogers solos on a street corner were a common sight. They also would hold the door open for your mom or anyone else's mom. You see, chivalry, although it smelled fun, hadn't died yet. The great posters done by Dizzy Dizzy Sanabria, no relation to me, right in the neighborhood, promoting the next dance, like it was announcing a great battle at the Coliseum in ancient Rome. The Irish guys with red curly hair going to, Afri going to an African-American barber to get their hair cut, straighten up. The brothers begging you to show them how to dance mambo so they could rap to a Latina. They were always listening to Cal Jada. Jada, the epitome of cool. The Italian barber my father took me to when I was very little, with the one guy dressed in black always sitting there reading the horse race results. The sound of them speaking in Italian while my father communicated with them in Spanish and them calling him, them calling him Don Jose. Dreamed of a better, if you dreamed of a better life, La Bolita. The candy store where you always went to buy a Spalding or Pennsylvania pinky for 25 cents and had to pay two cents for a cup of water in the sun. The Boogaloo, the dance style that brought everyone in the projects that was young, Latino, African-American together and told the old Mambo Nicks, 
You know something? We got our own shit. No one knew it. No one knew it was Cuban. Someone threw it with R&B combined, and no one cared. Saying hello, how are you, took too much time. Yo was enough. If you were in a good mood, you followed with the person's first name. If you were in a really bad mood, you just nodded. That was common. Why? Because everyone had some shit they were dealing with. The two blackouts, Serpico, the Nap Commission, Rockefeller, Lindsey B, Badillo, the wet tech scandal, were married Biagi and Stanley Simon, who raped the South Bronx, and were part of the reason it became the symbol of urban decay. Caco, the great Dimalero who lived in my neighborhood, walking around with rollers in his hair. <laughs> Candido Rodriguez, the young Dimalero, who had two little twin boys who were into marketing at a very young age. While walking home from school, if they saw some young bomberos, street drummers, they would yell at them, my father could kick your ass like Gomez, Bombo, and Timbales. <laughs> Rumbas in the park till past midnight in the canyons of the projects in the summer. Couldn't sleep. Who cares? You didn't want to. Don't have any drums? No problem. And Busson, the mailbox, would do fine. And of course, cars were made of real metal in those days. Imagine five guys playing Guaguan on fenders of cars. Forget about that stop show on Off-Broadway. It was invented in the South Bronx and in Bobby and Manhattan and Red Hook and Osudas in Brooklyn by a people desperate to keep their tradition and family units alive while a madness called Tecata, heroin, tried to destroy it and then. And Club Cubano on Prospect Avenue. My first pair of emo fake playboys when I was told were brought from Tom McCann. My first leather jacket, light years ahead of Run DMC. It's like this one. The first set of theme bottle sticks that I cut with a hacksaw. My mother and father struggling to buy me a drum set and me winding up with only half of one. The ecstasy of the final All-Stars at Yankee Stadium. The real Latino explosion on August 24th, 1973, where over 40,000 screaming freaking Ricans yelled for the music that sustained us. Except nobody noticed. The cops were shocked. <coughs> they didn't know that that many Boricuas lived in the Bronx. And then DJ Cool Herc looking up to the lamppost and the beginning of hip hop and the art of tagging on the subway. I was there. I saw it because cool DJ Herc went to the high school, Alfred E. Smith, right across from the projects that I lived. How could anyone bomb, spray paint an entire train and tell a whole cartoon story on an entire elevated subway? Easy. Imagination and cojones. Se fueron los judíos, los italianos y alemanos. The Aaron go brown. Marielitos, Vietnamese, Koreanos, Chicanos, Equatorianos, Colombianos, Dominicanos coming to New York City. Que cosa? Cumbia and merengue in the hood? Cool. But to me, Tabito Vasquez and Moisito, Joseito Mateo are still the men. The bravura of someone coming up to a rumbero playing Quito in the park while he's cooking with gas and asking them, Dame un poquito. The sound of cocinando que viva la música by Ray Barreto exploding from everyone's boom boxes, which they stole or brought on the cheap while the black out of 77 happened, at Orchard Beach. The extra kick that dancers from Brooklyn would do when they dance mambo. Our sacred temples, the Bronx Casino, the Hunts Point Palace, the Colgate Gardens, the Savoy Manor, Luigi, Marina Del Rey, me covering the TV, playing it real low, Having the lights off, just a clap, a glimpse of Ed Shaughnessy playing drums at the Tonight Show Orchestra at Johnny Carson when I was supposed to be asleep, or my sister telling me during the day, hey, you know Buddy Rich is going to be on it tonight. If mommy, I'll try to keep mommy asleep so you can watch. <laughs> now play a little mojones, watch your beach. One of the greatest pianists that ever lived, an organist who graduated from the Juilliard School of Music, Charlie Palmer, playing solo organ at a small little dive bar on Westchester Avenue. Andy Gonzalez, the greatest bass player that has ever come from our community, reading Mao's Little Red Book on the number six train. In Mao struck out, dealing with his demons. My father closed with his, eye, with his eyes closed, sitting in a rocking chair, smoking a cigar, and listening to Sergio Mendez. <clears throat> My mother calling me, mi negrito. Tito Puente finally making ocha in Santeria. New York City, just like I pictured it, it was the worst of times. 
but it was the best of times. I wouldn't trade it for anything in the fucking world. Yeah. Thank you for inviting today. And um, unlike 
Bobby and Angel, who grew up here and, and their music careers are, are bound in this neighborhood. Um, I was born here in the Bronx, but we left early and then I came back. So um, my experience growing up wasn't here. But since I've been back in the last 15 years, I have documented, um, worked on documenting the history of the music. And I'm not a musician, so I can't talk about it in terms of the music, but I was interested in the, um, the places and um, the history, the sociology of, of, of this music and what, what, how this community affected that. And in the work that we did, um, you know, this, this panel's about the last 30 years, the changes. Um, obviously, 30, 40 years ago, for the people who were from here, from the Bronx, we knew that there was a big change. Um, there were, as Bob said, there were many, many venues. I mean, this place was amazing. Um, the Tropicana, the Hunts Point Palace, the Caravana. I mean, big, great places. Um, after, of course, the Palladium was the main place in Manhattan, but this place was, was known for all its venues. Um, but in the 60s, you saw a lot of that because of the start of the what was going on in the Bronx, the in, you know the infrastructure, the economic bankruptcy in the, in the city, all these things came together, and so you have venues closing all over the place. But so that was one step, and then even more recently, you can see that there's actually even this is happening again. The few venues that are left are actually closing down too. I mean, we don't people ask me, "Will call me up?" I did my own hip hop. Where can I go dancing? And I was like, well, I, "I don't even know." Um, actually, I think. Um, the Jimmy Delgado Salsa, is that done? So, I mean, that was like one of the places that it was only renting a space, not even a real dance hall, and that's even, you know, not too sure. So, we're even seeing it now, and, and actually, I don't know if that is a, affects the musicians themselves, because years ago, you had the big bands, like Machito, and Tito Puente, playing all these places. Where is there a place for a big band or orchestra to play? Now, you have small clubs and bars where people play, so you're more tend to get smaller bands, so it really affects the music as well, the, the, the type of the music that we hear. And um, so it's interesting, Bobby and, and Angel talk a lot about growing up on the streets, and the street really informs and is really important, you know, for, for um, Roombas, you know, to go on and to play. And, um, you know, I always remember Bobby talked about Orchard Beach, where you grow up and there was Congas playing all the time. But recently we've been back to, to Orchard Beach as a, an outdoor area, and we hear Bomba on, which is really nice. Puerto Ricans playing their own instruments, not just Cuban instruments, so which is which is really nice to hear. So the, the streets are really one part of this um, of this equation, but the venues are also important too because without the venues you don't have all the dancers and the mambo dancers and, and all that. That culture needs the big venues and we don't have it anymore. So the documentation of this is very important. And it's not only the places, but also the people is very important. Um, from what I see the document as well. Um, a few years ago, actually what sort of was the inspiration for our Mambo Day, for Mambo Hip Hop film, we worked with The Point and with um, Al um, to put on a concert at, at 52 Park. And it was it's right across the street from us, a lot of, you know, from, from what was PS52. And um, we invited a lot of the alumni, any of the, the great musicians that were side men or band leaders to be at this concert at the park. And um, you, you name it, um, Ray Barreto came, Manuel Canedo, Benny Bonillo was there, Joe Quijano and Ray Cohen made their own ways from Puerto Rico to be there, um, Joe Rodriguez, uh, uh, who was Charlie Calvary's team ball player, um, Lefty Maldonado, um, A. Lima, there's a, a whole bunch of, um, Professor Joe Torres, there's a whole bunch of people who were alumni of the school or played there when they were really young, and they made this great concert. And, and I'm glad we did that on so many levels. It was a really great concert. It was a really great. Um, um, who, who um, I'm trying to think of? Hector Rivera was there. Of all these folks, and the reason I bring them up is because as I look back at those photos, <coughs> the photos and the footage now, it's really sad. But a lot of those folks have passed away. And um, Emma Rodriguez is the actual Ray Barreto, Joe Rodriguez, um, Manuel Pendo, A. Lima, Hector Rivera, um, Ray Cohen, all those people passed away. So the documentation is, uh, is really important of the places. History, as Bobby said, history, like everywhere. History in New York is everywhere. But in New York City, for some reason, we have a really, we tend to just ride over, um, build over mm -hmm. our history um, incredibly fast. And so to, in, to document the, the history of the places as well as the people, to get those stories, and hopefully with places like the Bronx Music Center, we'll be able to talk to the people and get those stories. Because only through the, the people themselves that we get those stories, so it's really important that we, we do that. And um, so, and you know, just, just an aside that it made me realize how fast that we go over our history is that um, 
I was doing a walking tour of the, the political, the 19th century Puerto Rican and Cuban exiles in the, the, during Jose Marti's time in Lower Manhattan. And I was like, oh, that's only 100 years ago, a little over 100 years ago, Jose Marti, 1895. From that era, all the, and there was a lot going on in that community in the 1800s. There's only one site left from Jose Marti's history that's actually extant in New York City. We've just bulldozed over and put up new buildings and new buildings. And that's going on in the Bronx, too, a lot of old places. And the exhibit that was done here about Casa Mareo is really important because really of all those places, Casa Mareo is like the, um, the lone survivor of, of these places. Most of the dance halls are gone. The building that housed the Tropicana is there. Um, that's there. The building that housed the Club Cubano is there, but they're gone. But Casa Mareo, which was opened in 1941, it's the oldest record store, stand, continually run records, Latin music store in New York City, opened by Rafael Hernandez's sister in 1941, bought by Mike Amadeo in 1969, and kept going. And so that is the last place that is part of this, the, the musical heritage, our musical legacy. Um, I'm here um, as Latinos, as Puerto Ricans in, in New York. And I'm happy to say that we were able to get Casa Mareo, that building that Casa Mareo is in on the National Register of Historic Places in 2003 because of that. But, you know, that might not be around for a long time either if, if, if no one keeps that going. So um, I might retire. So think about the history again, where it's going to be of that history. And that's just such an important place. And Mike is a treasure as well, a story that if you don't know him, I suggest you all go to Casa Mareo and talk to Mike. You will learn. Every time I go in there, I learn. Some, uh, some uh, something new or some other story, so it's been an amazing resource for us. So, um, yeah, I mean, this exhibit is based on Casa Mateo. So, you know, it's, it's great that it's inspired by that, but it's such an important place um, in New York. And um, one other thing I just would like to add, and maybe we'll just get to talk about that discussion in a little while, because when Casa Mateo is on Prospect Avenue there, that's sort of a prospect, Longwood and Westchester come together, that area was. Um, very important for Latinos as far as cult culturally and musically. You know, the Club Cubano was right down there around the corner, the 52, places like on Dawson Street where Arsenio lived at one point, Rodriguez, Orlando Marín was born and came from. Casa Mareo was there, Casa Alegre was there, Club 845 was there, um, the Prospect Theater where there were shows were, I mean, everything was like right there. Um, you know, there's interesting, there's a, new, there's a plaque there on the building that talks that really talks about the African American heritage there and puts the Latino musical heritage in a footnote almost. And it just tends that this tend as Latinos, this is very important that we need to make sure that we tend to our history because it's very a lot of times it is just become a footnote. You know, our you know our presence in jazz becomes a footnote. Our presence in neighborhoods becomes a footnote. So I think it's very important that we take charge and, and document it and remember it. So. Thank you very much. And I, I will add this that probably shows my age, but no one ever mentions the club three ten and a half on what's just uh, said. <laughs> okay. Please, come on. Blue is special to see <laughs> this. <laughs>
because I lived in that part of town. She lived on one side of the part of town, I lived on the other. But I lived through all that stuff, believe it or not. And um, it was an education and a half. Um, I lived in 961 Avenue St. John. Uh, and it was an all predominantly Jewish neighborhood at that time. And I was a little kid, and my mother used to walk me into the, to the playground. And I remember she walked me in, we play, and we'd go home. And the neighborhood took a toll, and took, went through a whole host of changes, and it got kind of messed up and fell down. But the people that are sitting here are some of the people that kind of fought back and didn't cut out. A lot of people left. Bobby and they said, well, test these people still. They said, they're leaving. They weren't going to stay there no more. The building started to burn, and everything started to happen, and nobody really wanted to do much of anything. I don't know what it was. Maybe it was my, my, my mother. My mother was an RN. And unfortunately, my mother now is 84 years old. She has Alzheimer's. But my mother was a, was a, a great example of uh, me as a kid growing up. It was just she had this community thing about her. I never knew that it was going to rub off on me, but inevitably that's exactly what it would happen. When, the, when I, I was living in that area, and, and, and by the way, I didn't go to 52 for all those people, and, and Benny can attest to this. Uh, I, I didn't go to, to IS 52. My mother sent me to St. Anne's, and she sent me to a Catholic school. Mm -hmm. And I think, Bobby, you went to Catholic school. Mm -hmm. yes. okay. And then I went to Scars for group. And then after I went to grade school, I went to Rice High School in Harlem. And, and so I, I, I never went to 52, but I always loved my community and my area. And I saw my area burn down. I mean, I remember walking in the streets so that I was scared that somebody would drag me into the building and take me off for the little few things that I had. I didn't have much, but I didn't want to get dragged into the thing. So those kind of were lasting impressions of my neighborhood, but I didn't walk away. And when we sit around the table and we talk about my camadero, which is something that we, we do talk about, I got to get lived there. Um, I was just there just now, before I came here, and I lost. <laughs> but I was there, and, and just like Elena and everybody else that's out there, um, I sponge off the old man. Um, in fact, talking a little bit about my camino, when are they going to give him his doctor? Uh, he's going to be 78 years old, I think, 78, he'll be 78, and he, he doesn't have a doctor. I mean, he should be called Dr. Amadeo. Just for all the stuff, and everybody individually can talk to you. He knows so much about music, and, and Elena's right about preserving. It's so important that we preserve, because my camarero might only be here for a certain amount of time, and then who's going to replace my camarero? And it's real, real important that we start understanding that. And then, in relationship to what I did, but going back to what Bobby was talking about also, um, uh, the key here is, is the education component. When Bobby talked about how he, you know, 52 does not use a pro well. I just met, um, maybe this would be my third time, January 17th, with the new principal of IS-52, which is called now MS-302. And uh, the first meeting I had, I invited Benny to come with us, and I went and sat with Vivian Vasquez, and we had a meeting with the new principal. And, and, and I spoke to Elena not too long when I said, Elena, I might need you to make a phone call for me. And I, I talked to a few musicians and a few people. I might need you to make a phone call for me too because we're trying to get a music program put back in the school starting next year. It's a real important factor that these kids start learning all this stuff early on so that we can have more bodies, bodies and audience in the schools and more Eddie Palmer's and all these other great musicians that came out there. Ray Loretto graduated from 52 in 1944. Mm -hmm. wow. Oh my God, that was not even around in 1944. Mm -hmm. But, and, and, so, and some of the musicians that, and then I thought when we, when, we, when we partnered with City Lord at the time, some of those guys were great, they left their mark. But you won't know much about it because you won't be a book that's gonna tell you about Roy Cohen. There won't be a book about Hector Rivera, who, by the way, went that day in his wheelchair. He, he was so happy to be there. And Benny was Manny Oquendo, who was out there too. I mean, there were so many great, great musicians. So it's important that the documentation process, uh, we need to be able to show that history. It's real, real important. Now, I'll tell you a little bit about what I do to try to document what I've been doing. I, I started a group called 52 People for Progress back in 1980. I didn't know what I was doing. I was just a guy. I, I, the neighborhood felt bad. And they was, did tell him that um, he was crazy. The building, the, the neighborhood had burned down and the park was abandoned and the parks department didn't want to really do much for the, for the park. 
And so I, I started with a little can of paint, you know, those little real kids, small ones. <laughs> but of course, I painted a, I think a handball line or two. And then the next day, I saw the guy, hey, let's, let's paint a bench. And then we painted one of the bench, a few slats. And, and then that almost started to snowball. And then it just continued. And since 1980 up to now, we've been, we've been in that park 30, we'll be 32 years now, May, May 25th, we'll make 32 years of doing quite long too. I don't get paid a nickel for it. I don't care about that, because I, I did it from here. But, but the key to the success I've had in the park was because I was able to create stability through music. That was the key mitigating factor for me. Music was what allowed the park to be more stable. I'm able to do a, a concert series in the park, and, and not, not, not for anything, but, but of course, Bill's helped too, because back then I didn't know what I was doing, and Bill was saying, hey, we'll get you a band there. And they put a band there, and, and I didn't only if I, I, I used to put the, the concerts in the pool every year. And if I had 40 people to come, I was lucky. And, and I had the, 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 the block drunk, he would dance with this lady. And they would dance like, she'd be over there, you know, and then he'd dance with each other. And I, I didn't know what I was doing. I, you know, and then as time went on, I saw that the music kind of calmed people down. I said, boy, this would be great if I can continue to do music in the park. And then kind of, kind of started to smoke more. I started to perfect it a little bit better and get a little bit you know, a little nicer at it, and started to, to shape it up and, and start to gel. And once I knew that it would gel, then that was the hook. That was my hook. And I said, if I can put music for these people on and I can keep them preoccupied, then they're going to do what I want to do, and maybe the park will calm down. And, and that's exactly what happened. Back uh, after the 80s, when I, I, first start, I started to learn a little bit more, then the 90s came in, and the parks department came and said, we're going to build another handball court. Uh, after this handball court in an uh, open space, we're doing a $1.5 million expansion project. And I said, no, man, we don't want a handball court. They said, no, our, our handball is underutilized. And, and I said, I'm a paddleball player. We don't need no more handball courts. We need something else. They said, no, we're going to build you a handball court. And I said, well, if you're going to try to build a handball court, we're going to stop it. So you better get ready. And so they had to cut a deal with me on the side and say, well, if you could have anything you want here, what would you want? And the minute they said that, I said, have it here. <laughs> I didn't I talk nothing about amphitheaters and I just I just I needed a space. I needed a space and whatever that space I know what I know what it meant. I was smart enough to know what an amphitheater meant, but you know what so they said amphitheater and so they went back to the drawing board and they said, okay. Start to develop this epic. And if you've been there, some of you have, some of you have, it's real European looking. It's got columns. And it's a, it, it, now, looking in hindsight, bad guy would have said, yeah, that's got to change the design of it. But anyway, it's there now. And we, and we got this, we got this amphitheater. And as a result of the amphitheater and doing these concerts, then I tried to, I tried to develop a, a, some kind of a system. Well, how can I do this? And I found out that that, 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 that concert would cost me more money. I'm, Friday or Saturday, then it would cost me on a Wednesday. So I said, well then, well, Wednesday would be a great pump day. That's right in the middle of the week. Yeah. And so we decided, okay, Wednesday. And then I wanted to do one or two, and then I said, well, how about we kind of like do some kind of a series or something, a few? And then it kind of, kind of started to snowball. And, and then Bill would feed me a few concerts, uh, New York State. No, 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 no. no. It would be the phone calls around, you know, I need some extra help. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it would, it would come. And, 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 and let me say, I'm grateful to all those people. Uh, I remember Norma Torres, sure. uh, you know, who's now in Florida, yeah. who, who you know, she, she gave Charlie Palmieri to play in 1983. She, she brought me Charlie Palmieri to play my part, uh, um, Orlando Marini and Joe Piano on the same stage. Mm. I mean, and, and this stuff just started to snowball and start to do this concert series. Today, uh, we are doing 187 concerts, and we're, 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 we're 13 shows too. And, 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 and I was looking to some footage because I read the paper and I read all the questions, and I said, oh my god, there's a lot of questions here. That they send us a pre, uh, pre-existing questionnaire, some questions that they, we might touch on tonight. And so I'm being, I'm sighted here, I lost my eyesight. My left eye doesn't work well. But anyway, so I started looking at it, and they said something, you know, back in jazz and all this stuff, and, and my concert series is called The 
52 Latin jazz concert series. And Fabio tested it, and so will Angel. My venue is not a Latin jazz venue. My venue is a straight up hard salsa venue. If you come to one of my concerts, it's because you're gonna dance. You're not gonna sit there and listen to the guy and take a solo. I'm gonna take a solo, but you're gonna dance. That's what it comes down. So then everybody starts asking, well, why did you, why did you put it, the 52 Latin jazz? You could have called it a 52 uh, salsa concert, hard salsa. You could have called it anything. Why did you put that word in there? Early in my life, I was so tuned to some of the stuff that Angel had seen. I thought when they said about Mongo Santa Maria that his music was monkey music, and then he went and collected on the R&B, the Latin, the, the, the jazz market. He collected on three markets, put all the money in his pocket, and laughed at everybody and said, yeah, my, money, my, 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 my music might be monkey music, but I'm getting paid, baby. That was the bottom line, and that's how it happened. So I grew an affinity and a love for Latin jazz. I've always loved it. If I could change it all today, I would have Latin Jazz Mondays instead of my Latin Jazz concert series on Wednesdays. And it would be Latin Jazz straight up. Because I think that in our music, and you guys are musicians, and I'm not a musician, but our music is fine. But there's never a period. And that's why when you throw a concert, I always go. Because there's not a period at the end of the music. And so we can we can emulate what we want. We can do all those rhythms and we can learn all that stuff, that stuff we learned from Cuba and bring it and play all that salsa. And it's good. And we love it because that's what we have. We have that affinity for it. But the bottom line is there's not a period. And just like you get excited, Angel, you say, I, I just touch in the albums, I get excited because what, when I used to hear Cal Jada, I used to say, oh my God, that is just unbelievable. And then I Mongo would drive me nuts. I still got Mongo albums that I, if I play you a Mongo album today that I have in my house, you'd say, wow, when was that? Did you do that like last year? And it's probably 25 years ago that he probably did that. So I named my concert series that. I've always had this affinity for jazz. I've always loved it. Um, I like listening to Duke Bellington, and I love Miles Davis, and, and my collection is equally proportioned. I have a lot of good salsa music, and I have a lot of great Cuban music. I got a lot of nice jazz music. I can listen to Dexter Gordon anytime. And, you know, those are the guy and Herbie Man. Those are the kind of things I've always, I've always had this affinity for. So I did the concert series. I've, I've established it, but there's more to it than all of that. The real, the real bottom line here is that the, the young people need to be educated so that they don't miss out on Angel, and they don't miss out on Bobby, and they don't miss out on some of these people because they don't know what's happening. These kids don't know what's happening in terms of music. I went to speak to uh, Willie Rodriguez from Santa Cruz High School. Um, I had a meeting with him. He was so cool. He, he saw me because I wanted to ask him questions about teachers, curriculum, because I'm trying to get this program for next year in, in the school when I was 52, with MS today or two now. And, and he gave me such good information. But you know, the best part of the whole gig was when I walked through the halls, you know, he took me through the string section and everybody was in there playing Titanic or something. I don't know what And then I went to the voice part and everybody was singing. And then I went to the piano area and everybody was playing. And, and as you walk through the corridor, all you heard was all this great music. I felt like overwhelmed. I said, oh man, this is. This is what I want to be able to at least give a little bit to 52 so that maybe in the future some of these kids develop and become Benny Bonillas and all these other great. Eddie Palmer is a nine time Grammy Award winner and, and, and they don't have nothing. They don't, they, they don't know Eddie Palmer from Ed the Horse. They don't, know, they, don't, they don't know who that is. And it's imperative that our kids be able to understand and learn that. And whatever contribution. I can give in my venue, and, uh, and quickly, and I'll get off. In, in 1991, I don't know if, if you're a trombone player that you always play with, Chris Washburn, yeah. he's a doctor. He, but did he have his doctor in, at that time? Doctor that music. But, but, but in, in 1991, did he have it at that time? Okay. Well, well, in 1991, he, he played in my part. I got my hands He played with, with Ray Baker. He was a skinny looking guy. He looked like he didn't have a doctor at that time. He looked like he didn't eat too well at that time. But I was, I was running through my stuff yesterday. Who was that? Uh, uh, Chris Washington. Wash 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 yeah, and he was with Ray Baker playing. And then a few years later, I had Mitch Foman play with Oscar Hernandez and a whole host of other great musicians that came in. So I have a few little Latin jazz things, but, but my genre is not Latin jazz, although I have this love for it. But we need to be able to draw those things, those parallels together, and we need to be able to, to make sure that the kids especially get the bottom line. And then 
me and what I do, I invite you to come. When I will start July 25th, a quick plug, July 25th, <laughs> 2012. It's a first Wednesday, and we ask you to come. And if it's progressive, I like it. And if we can, if somebody willing to, to volunteer a different kind of a day and not Wednesday to change that genre and do something different, uh, Jazz Mondays, anything, then if that's what we need to do and we can do it, then I'm down. I have the thing with that. That's what the village gave us to do. But the, but, the, but the venue is there, and we need to be able to, if the theater sits there, if I don't do a concert in the theater and I don't raise the money, then the theater sits, sits dormant. And so it's important that we don't let those kind of things happen, that, that the stuff stays dormant, and, and we need to be able to What's the average attendance of your one? Ah, uh, man, we can we can we I can't tell you, but I'm going to tell you, it's like 450 people. <laughs> and, and the theater doesn't max for it, it, it only maxes like, 50, 50, 50. So I squeeze a few extra bodies in there, but, <laughs> but, 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 but it's cool because I squeeze those bodies, but when everybody leaves, they leave with a smile. And then I get the last joke, I stand by the door and I say, because we ask, when you come in, we ask you for a dollar donation. Not an admission, it's a dollar donation. And so I stand in the front and I say, ah, por un peso, chacho, que mucho te de brother. You guys have a call for one dollar, 50 cents a set, I give you two cents of music, and everybody leaves with a smile. Every Wednesday for ten Wednesdays, you can't be that. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you real quick. Yes. When the park opened with that amphitheater. Yes. It's beautiful. If you haven't been, there. did the mayor show up or the vice mayor president when it all finally opened? When it when it finally opened, uh, no. I will tell you who, who opened it. Uh, Congressman Serrano showed up. The, uh, and mm -hmm. Freddie didn't come. I think he sent Joe Gibbier yeah. at the time. Yeah. And that was back in. The, and the theater's named the. The, the Teatro Miranda, the Ray Miranda Theater, named after a, a police officer, but also a volunteer friend of ours who had died in a terrible car accident and we wanted to give a living tribute to him, and so we named it the Teatro Miranda. But it, it's, it's a cozy thing. We're, we're trying to get now a $5.5 million now, Captain, we try to get good luck for that one, but we're trying to get it done because the park has to be redone. It's been, it's been there since 54, and that little piece of the park was done in, in 90. And what happened was it lasted 20 years, but the Parks Department failed to make some, some, some real important uh, <laughs> construction decision choices. And so now some of the, the, the theater now started to sink, and, and some other things are happening. But we're working hard, and what we want to do with the theater is we want to try to put a cover on it, Bob, so that the musicians don't get wet, because every time if it rains, we have to cancel. And so, and try to make uh, some more uh, seating so we get a little bit higher and a little bit more close. And all that, all those columns that are in the theater, we're trying to change that into a very, it's a very European look. I think uh, Lee Weintraub was the, was the designer of the yeah, time. Yeah, the yeah. architect. And, and we spoke to him, and it was a short amount of money. There was a lot of money. And, and, uh, and so, we try to change that design and try to make it a little bit. It's 5.5, so if anybody here has 5.5 that they want to give to us, <laughs> uh, but, uh, Bill will give you my information and you can send us the check and we'll, we'll take it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank
the guests here have tremendous memories that we have it being covered uh, by Bronx men and, and, and Bronx Who's Character Center, and as well as uh, Bronx of Art Center. But Michael Max, Max Nani has been the executive director of Bronx Men, who has been recording, archiving our music history of the Bronx. This is an important collection of what he has done over the years. Uh, he does it with the most impossible resources. He's always made his uh, assets available to the community, and he's been a friend to many of us. Uh, and we're working, the Bronx Men's Country Center's working with, we'll work with uh, Bronx Net to figure out a way that we can archive and document the music of the last 30 years of, of the Bronx, which he has what, 4,000? Uh, what, 4,000? <coughs> what would he tell him? Keep going, So, Michael Max, Snobby, friend, Thank you, thank you, Bill. Um, well, in my home, growing up in Kingsbridge in the Bronx, I would hear, well, you would hear big band sounds. You'd hear Cuban music. You would hear uh, swing music. Wow, cool. You'd uh, find a record collection of my father, which uh, spanned decades and was a wide range of taste. But my father. Uh, you know, visited Cuba regularly, had many Cuban friends. Uh, a cushionist man named Monteco would visit us, and we would visit him. <laughs> and I was always intrigued as a, a boy growing up in the Bronx by uh, the percussion, the, the drum. And in uh, second grade, uh, cultural arts camp, I decided, you know what, I'm going to spend my independent study time with a, a teacher, a drum teacher. I want to learn to play drums. And well, uh, you know, 15 minutes into my first lesson for the whole summer, um, the drum instructor uh, said, you know what, go play. <laughs> <laughs> Do whatever you want. It's her free time. And I said, okay. So I started to develop a, a penchant for the visual arts. And I started to develop that, which leads to what I'm doing now. But why do I mention the story? Because I need to uh, make sure we recognize the great teachers in this room. It's an honor to be a part of this Bronx Music Heritage Center panel. And you know, I salute people like Bobby and Angel and all the great mentors in this room who help develop talent because it is preserved. It's part of preserving the tradition, the passing on of that knowledge, that legacy. And it also leads to the creation of new forms and very exciting things. Uh, at um, BronxNet Television, uh, the station that I've been with since Bronxnet started um, two decades ago, well, just about almost two decades ago. It's an open work. Uh, we've trained at Bronxnet thousands of people who live in the Bronx in media production so they can tell their stories, so that they can share their stories. Uh, they take training in studio production and field production. They learn how to use cameras, and they go out in the field with the cameras, free access to these cameras and editing facilities, and they produce programs. They produce programs in the studio. They, once they get certified, once you get certified, if you live in the Bronx, you can take training at Bronx and get certified and produce your own program. So, well, a vibraphone uh, player, a vibraphone player named Steve Pucci was amongst the first uh, people trained at Bronx Net close to 20 years ago. He uh, was playing around the Bronx. He, you know, he felt there was a need. He felt a uh, Bronx net, you know, people are covering the music scene in the Bronx, but there's so much going on, and I need to do this. He originally uh, was covered at Bronx net, you know, performing, and he said, you know what? I want to do uh, a show that will lead to, you know, sharing what Latin jazz is about. And Latin jazz, alive and kicking, was born. He took the training and he hit the ground running. And that is really one of the longest uh, running shows um, 
uh, you know, dedicated to Latin jazz and, and jazz. You know, there's been there's a history, a uh, you know, four-decade history of public access in New York City. And in the Bronx, it's really, it really came a little bit later, so it's, it's close to two decades. So you know, Jazz Corner and some of these other programs were great musicians come into the studio, and it, as well as uh, the, um, the, 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 the media producers go out into the field and, and, and produce and share programs. Steve Pucci, uh, you know, did something that really uh, became sort of a resurgence of Latin jazz. Many say, uh, many say it was sort of became sort of a renaissance because this was in the 90s and this was um, really when channels were just beginning, they were nascent. So we would air Latin jazz alive and kicking, you know, seven times a week. And, uh, you know, musicians would tell Steve, hey, you know, we're getting jobs, we're getting gigs across New York City, not just in the Bronx, uh, you know, during that time. So, BronxNet, in addition to training the public in media production, we also produce programs uh, with uh, professionals uh, that uh, are, you know, really telling the stories of the people of the Bronx in different ways. Uh, so you see the diversity of, of the Bronx on the BronxNet channels. And when you look at a, a show that's been kind of long running, like Bronx Live, where we send our out into Bronx venues, great places like uh, Postal Center for the Arts and Culture, Lehman College, uh, Stages, Lehman Center for Performing Arts, Fergonis Theater, uh, 52 Park, when you go to the Casitas, when you go to, you know, really places that span from Jimmy's Bronx Cafe uh, to, to other less conventional places, to, to Little Puerto Rico, where Dave Valentin lives, and he, uh, you know, gives a little performance and talks about uh, the music and, and the cross-pollination. So, you know, he's been able to capture and tell these stories as well as train the public to, to share uh, this important information. And, you know, I, I gotta tell you, it's the arts presenters that are a part of preserving this music and sharing and disseminating this music as well. So, innovators like Wallace Ingram Edgecombe at Hostel Center for the Arts and Culture, he is, you know, sharing programming from local artists, emerging artists in the Bronx and around New York City, but also from around the world, international caliber artists that come to this place that is a gateway, uh, the Bronx, where hip hop was born, where salchata reggaeton is uh, thriving, where uh, you have um, Latin jazz, you have duop, you have so many things because we have African Americans, we have Puerto Ricans, we have Dominicans, we have uh, an emerging Honduran community. We have, uh, you know, the Italian uh, community that started here, and you know, it's through the decades that these forms kind of informed each other. And you know, there's a spirit to jazz and improvisation. There's sort of a spirit to the open work that is community media and and and, and Bronx that, and uh, what the possibilities are. So, you know, we sort of have a transmedia approach. So it's promotion of uh, events that are coming up. It's uh, the documentation of these concerts uh, at the venues in the field, and it's also um, sharing this content, disseminating it live and, and uh, uh, through encore presentations on television channels. The Bronx is the first community media center in the nation to cable cast on six channels, to telecast on six channels as well, as now we are uh, streaming on the web and uh, sharing these programs to video on demand. So, it is. I think I should add that Cable Vision wanted to cut his cord and he managed to beat Cable Vision and expand your resources. Is that correct? We have a partnership with uh, Cable Vision, we have a partnership with Verizon Files. Uh, it was because of the people of the Bronx speaking out for their media access rights and democracy in the digital age and having a local voice that we were able to uh, make sure that we could provide services that are 21st century services. And we are going to be upgrading our studios on the beautiful campus of Lehman College in the Northwest Bronx. But you know what else? We're developing South Bronx uh, studios, and we're developing East Bronx studios, and we're up, we're, we're, you know, and we're looking forward to partnerships. And we have many great partnerships with the people in this very room. And some of what we do is you know, documentaries. It's, it's digital storytelling. I mean, we, we uh, Elena spoke very eloquently about the importance of, of 
of, of doing the research, of digging into the archives, of pulling uh, the different pictures, music, images, whatever footage you can find, and you know, producing something that will preserve the knowledge, that will share, that will inform, and that will lead to new forms. So uh, Walter Garacoa and I produced a documentary called Migration, the Puerto Rican Experience. He's, and by the way, Walter Garacoa is somebody, again, it's uh, a Bronx site that got his media career started uh, at a community media center in the Bronx called BronxNet. And let's take, let's take a little look at a, a, a highlight from this documentary, Migration, the Puerto Rican Experience. I attended the Berkeley College of Music in Boston, a very prestigious institution uh, in terms of the world of jazz, and I happened to be the first Puerto Rican to be at the school, and uh, I happened to be the first one to graduate also. In the old days, in the Bronx, in the summertime, you heard the sound of congas all the time. So as soon as it started getting warm, all of a sudden you hear So as for Mama La Rumba, you hear Cuban Guaguancó played by mostly Puerto Ricans in the park. And of course when the drum calls, everybody starts gathering around. That's it. That's it. It's a highlight. I don't know. 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 I in the South Bronx and through Mosco Center for the Arts and Culture, that you're seeing people from around the world coming to the Bronx, converging here, great artists from the Caribbean and Puerto Rico coming to the Bronx uh, at Ostos and at Rincon Criollo, because this is the nexus for that genre of music in many ways. You know, it, it, it came out of Africa, and it's, it's, you know, it, it's developed on the islands, and, you know, it, and, you know these arts institutions these important anchor institutions that are our schools like Hostos and Lehman College and the Celia Cruz School for Music, uh, you know, as well as uh, the organizations and institutions represented here are kind of critical to preserving this. Um, so there are emerging communities in the Bronx that uh, I think need to be mentioned and that are very significant populations like uh, the Honduran community and the Gryphonic community. Uh, it's uh, a culture that speaks uh, Spanish, and English, but also Garifuna, which is a Native American tongue. It's a uh, it's, um, pretty amazing culture, and we've trained many Bronxites from the Garifuna community, and they are very active producers. And um, you know, the, 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 the important thing to note is, in preserving these traditions, things are being forgotten. You know, Garifuna is a language, and it's important to preserve that language because for a while, I mean, there's no Griffin dictionary. It's just starting to be built now by many, by people in the Bronx, actually. Uh, and uh, one of the um, one of the major Griffin uh, singer, songwriter, musicians is Aurelio Martinez. Uh, you know, UNESCO declared uh, Griffin culture an intangible masterpiece of humanity of the oral tradition because it, it's, it, it needs to be preserved. It's in danger of being lost. And this great musician who's lived in the Bronx, who, whose uh, family was you know, brought up in Brooklyn, his, his parents lived in Brooklyn, but he came to live in the Bronx because that's where the Garifuna culture is, is in the Bronx. And um, he 
He, uh, he, he, he lives here, he, he now lives around the world, but he is really one of the few singers that sings in Griffin. And it's, it's music that really crosses the traditional, it's jazz, it's uh, all sorts of um, really wonderful sounds. And he's been to Bronxton on shows like Honduras, New York, uh, really maybe three times a year. So he talks about the music, he performs, uh, and uh, there are many other great artists that live in the Bronx from uh, the Honduran community, which is probably about 100,000 right now in the Bronx. And um, they include Ka uh, Kaita, who uh, is a great singer of a paranda tradition, which is different from the Puerto Rican paranda, but it's, it's, it's traditional, it's, it's wonderful, and it's, you know, it's laments, it's stories, it's about riffing the life, it's, it, and it has an affinity with uh, the Afro-Caribbean music uh, that, uh, that the Puerto Ricans celebrate, love, and perform. And so we um, have active producers like Honduras, New York, where if you uh, tune in on a Monday night at 8 o'clock, you will see um, the, you know, some, of the, you know, some of this great music performed. You'll hear uh, local information and global information. Why? Well, as I mentioned, BronxNet web streams. So anywhere you are in the world, you can watch BronxNet. Uh, because you don't live in the Bronx. You know. right. That's right. Uh, BronxNet.org, BronxNet.tv. Um, you know, tell your friends. So if, if, uh, if, so if, if um, at one point, uh, we had a web streaming um, uh, capability that was limited by the number of people that looked at it. And with shows like Riffin in New York, uh, the, the whole, I mean, because of limited bandwidth, we have limited resources. We are a not-for-profit 501c3, after all. Um, you know, it, it, would, it would be maxed out because so many people are ac accessing this, not only from New York City, but also from Honduras. Um, and we've upgraded this capability significantly. So if, you, if you're tuning in, if you come visit the studios, you'll, you'll hear calls uh, from not only the Bronx, but also from Honduras because we're streaming and it is, uh, act, you know, they're active, actively watching in other parts of the world. And this is just, you know, just another, I, another way that sort of the Bronx uh, is, uh, is, is a gateway for global communities. If, I know you have rec recorded a lot that Wally at Ostos has done uh, and what Al has done at the Supreme Court. If the audience here or the audience who wants to find that information, do you have active archives that they can? Yes, um, we, you know, like many organizations, institutions, major, uh, major museums, and, and, and you know, archiving is, is, is important, it's critical. We have a huge catalog of tapes uh, of uh, footage shot across the Bronx over the decades, which we're digitizing, which we are meta-tagging, which uh, we um, are, um, you know, we had librarian, library science uh, uh, people work with us on, and uh, you know that that's something in development. But uh, you know, currently you can see uh, a number of things on the channels on BronxNet. Cable subscribership is still very high in the Bronx, and we are on channel 67 through 70 on Cablevision. Soon to be two more channels on Cablevision, and also channels 33 through 38 on Verizon. Bias. Um, so, so on our website, which is highly functional and, and you know it, it, it's uh, pretty rich, uh, you'll find uh, information. But if you're looking for something, my email is max at bronxnet.org. If you want training in the Bronx, you can find information at the website. If you know, it, it's it's very important to pro provide uh, these connections and capabilities. And it would be great one, you know, at some point to have. A, a connection, a, a sort of a patch panel at 52 Park or a place where we can just stream the content live. Michael, thank you very much. Uh,
Um, I, I think the legacies are, are going to continue. And there's new generations out there of, of musicians and, and, and kids that are really interested in Latin jazz and really interested in the culture. It might be a small percentage, but there is a lot of young people in the tank. People like Bobby, myself, I'm a teaching artist. I'm out in Canarsie. I'm out all over the city teaching uh, culture and, 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 and history and what I know, my personal uh, views. And, and uh, so, so I think you know the inheritance is, is never forgotten. And it's going to be passed on from generation to generation. Even when I see a cipher of, of uh, uh, hip hoppers and some beatboxes and they're doing the MC. That gives me confidence also that, you know, this culture is going to continue. You know, and so legacies are going to be around for a long time. Uh, I have a friend of mine named Baba Israel that I perform with, uh, um, open up the Roots, a group called Roots, and he says to me, hey, Joe, I'm, I'm a white man, but hip hop, me lleva, you know, hip hop, to me, from Africa, to Jamaica, to the Bronx, to me. And then if you look at the history of our music, it's the same thing. You know, from, from Africa to the islands, to the Bronx, to New York City, with the in the interview, with the freaking New York attitude, you know, and, and, and it's here, and then it, and to us, you know. So the Bronx had, you know, like, and then our city lawyer years ago came up and the Mamba Hip Hop tours were uh, TV uh, uh, crews from all over the world coming down, you know, and kids in the point, and, and you know, you, you, you know, I want to say, look, you know, this is our music, this is American music, so it's gospel, what we call salsa, uh, Creole music, rock and roll, jazz, and I can go on and on and on, and people come here from all over the world to us here in the Bronx, but because we have it in our hands, you know, uh, and a lot of us are uh, 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 not concerned with other things, but you know, we, we don't take care of it, you know. <coughs> and there's uh, just a few people like us that really pass down, you know, uh, Elena and, and, and you guys and Bill, you know, that really, really tend to this, but how do we get this message out to the young generation in a broader sense, you know? Uh, of the exchanges that you talk about. You know, bringing it together. You know, and, and, and I'll tell you a quick story on that. Uh, Woody Everidge, my compadre, got to play with Victor Venegas, a Mexican bass player, the original bass player on Afro Blues with Momo Santa Maria. So now, he's talking about a band called Rimo Nuevo. They're playing the gig with a gentleman named Rolando Losado played that Losado. Losado, right? He played that in the flute play. So now they're playing the gig, and now Losado doesn't speak English. And this man comes up to him and starts talking to him, so he calls Victor over to uh, translate. I don't know what's going on. So the fact was that the guy wanted to know what kind of changes, and you know, he was doing other flute, and all that stuff, they had a 10 minute conversation. So now the guy walks away. And, and Osano says to Victor, go get him, what's his name, what's his name? Victor chased after the guy and says, what's your name? He says, John Coltrane. Now, so, so the interchange, getting back to the interchanging, you know, there was already, among the musicians, it was already happening. Way before, you know, these companies, it's like hip hop. Kids had concession stands in front of clubs, and that was the only time that these record companies came out. I said, oh shit, these kids are making money. They're selling their cassettes, look at this, they got, you know, they don't remember that in the South Bronx and the Bunny of the Bronx, they, they had clubs in abandoned buildings, and, and this, this hip hop was a voice of the young, you know, so, um, legacies are going to last forever, for me, you know, for me. Uh, the Living Legend Tributes, I, I, and again, I, I want to thank Weko, Nancy Biederman, uh, uh, for allowing me, you know, because these are, these are, we have wants and needs, I think this is a need to recognize our people. Uh, even down to the guy on the corner that's selling out for 35 years. You know? You know, I want Bobby to respond to a meeting that we were at about four years ago, I guess, five years ago at WBGO. When WBGO took the Rackin' Jazz crews off on Saturday nights. Uh, uh, it was on a 
Yeah, I don't know. 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 Bobby and everybody else, uh, Ray, were very articulate and say, we don't need to be ghettoized into our place. We need to be used and inter integrated and incorporated and stop using non-Latino artists playing Latin jazz and use us. And this is one of the strongest voices that they well, I mean, just to review real quick, WB Joe, we don't have a 24-hour jazz station anymore in New York City. Last time we had that, was when we had WRVR, which I think it came off the air in 1980. They were a 24-hour jazz station. Before that, everybody listens to 1010 wins WINS. WINS used to be a jazz station at one time. Those of you who are old enough to remember. I mean, I don't, I wasn't, I'm not old enough, but I had air checks. <laughs> And the issue was, uh, so we listened to WB Joe. That services the new, the tri-state area of WB Joe. Now they're getting a new transmitter on a building in Manhattan, so we'll be able to hear WB Joe much clearer in the Bronx. Sometimes you can't hear it. Mm -hmm. I, I'll be driving, and sometimes I have to like stop at a certain corner just to hear listening to something on WB Joe. But the issue was that they took off a specialty show that they had that was Latin, played Latin jazz artists for two hours. So I, you know, I used the power of the internet at the time to start getting everybody involved. To make a long story short, even Nidia Velasquez, the congressman that got involved and stuff there, I went to the board meetings. At first I was the only one at the board meetings, the monthly board meetings that anybody could go to, but nobody knew that. So I started showing up, sitting there, then Papo Vasquez comes, then Patricia Rivera, anyway, through activism, not only did we get the show back and prove to them that, well, first of all, the Latino population is so big, why would you take this specialty show off? And second of all, there's so many Latinos playing jazz in the mainstream anyway, why don't you incorporate the, uh, in the regular programming, Latin jazz, integrate it as part of the regular <coughs> mainstream jazz programming. So now in WBGO, to make a long story short, not only do they have the specialty show for two hours, eight to 10 on Tuesday nights, but every second or third cut, that a, that a DJ plays is a Latin-oriented jazz cut. It doesn't have to be Afro-Cuban jazz, it could be Brazilian jazz, it could be some uh, Norbo Tango by Astor Piazzolla, you know, but it, it is from that realm. So the point of that story is that you must become activists. You cannot sit back and just say, oh, well, I'm not, you know, I'm here in this place again, whatever. The thing that's exactly that should inspire you is the fact that we have a multicultural president. People tell me, oh, we got our first black person. I go, no, no, we got our first mulatto person. He's half black and he's half white. That means he's Puerto Rican. <laughs> 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 That's a great chance. <laughs> you know, after that meeting, and I know it's the change, and I would, and I'm an avid listener of BGO, and I will count one Latin jazz number every two hours. Uh -huh. Called, what's his name, Cepheus? Cepheus Falls. I sent him an email and said, listen, one every two hours is not good enough. I told him the point now is like one every two or three. Bobby also told us about Ram. Right, which leads to the next thing. In terms of activism, most of you here will just come to this meeting and decide to not do anything other than the fact that you came in and tell some people, you know, maybe you'll go on Facebook if you're on Facebook, hey, I was at a great event, you know, that you know, the music, the culture lives amongst yourselves. Don't freaking keep it to yourselves. Mm -hmm. It's the holidays, Hanukkah, Christmas. You want to turn, the easiest thing to do is to turn on somebody else to the things that you love. You don't keep the things that you love to yourself. That's being selfish. You, you share them with other people. So if you have a young person in your household, or a nephew, or a niece, or whatever, and you love the music of, say, uh, Poncho Sanchez, or Bobby Sinabria, or it doesn't matter. And you say, this is a, uh, in, on Christmas time, or whatever they're not, they open up the presents. Hey, aunt, uh, uh, uncle, what's this? 
It was, well, I got you three records. I got you a Poncho Sanchez record, a Mongo Santa Maria record, and something by a new uh, an artist that's been doing some progressive things, Miguel Sonor. But I never heard of these people. What kind of music is this? I, you know I like Beyonce. He goes, no, 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 I know you like that. I know you like that. But you need to hear this because you don't know what you're missing out on. You know? Because you can eat McDonald's all your life, okay? But there's a lot more food out there than just McDonald's. There's a lot more food than just rice and beans. And, and, I don't, and you know, there's a lot more than arroz con pollo out there. Any well-rounded person is a person that is a lover of all forms of art. And we have so many things happening here in the Bronx. We have affordable theater at Burgoyne's. It's one of the most progressive theater available. Um, music concerts at Hostos, Lehman, and, and smaller venues. There's going to be music at this uh, housing complex, et cetera, et cetera. You have to become activists and in terms of what the Grammys have done. April, on April 6th, they cut 31 categories. Over 70% of those categories are racially and ethnically based. They cut out Zydeco music, KG music, traditional blues, contemporary blues, Latin jazz, Contemporary jazz, they cut out instrumental country music, they cut out several forms of Mexican music, they cut out children's music. They, I mean, it's ridiculous. They cut out uh, Native American music, Hawaiian. Hawaiian music, they cut out several, like four categories of classical music. These are categories, the, this is the National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences. The key word, academy, which is a Latin rooted word, academy, a place, a scholarly place champions knowledge by exposing it to other people. The main mission of the, the Grammys, the National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences, is not only to celebrate on that TV show, but to nurture and propagate all forms of American music, and they fail to do so. Their mission statement by cutting out these 31 categories. We've been fighting it left and right. And yeah, we, we, so right. We, yeah, we instituted a lawsuit on August 1st, it's being uh, Judge uh, Jeffrey Oring is uh, has the case now. He's reviewing it. Myself and three other plaintiffs in re a class action lawsuit in regards to the cutting of the Latin jazz category, which is an American form of music. It wasn't born in Cuba. It wasn't uh, the first form of Latin jazz, Afro-Cuban jazz. Wasn't born in Cuba. It was born on 110th Street and Fifth Avenue, Machiro and the Afro Cubans in 1939. It's an American form of music, ladies and gentlemen. That means I don't care how white you are, I don't care if you're from the Appalachians or whatever, it, it's part of your birthright as an American. Just like Appalachian music is part of my birthright as an American. Okay? Just like the blues is part of my birthright as an American. Just like rock and roll is part of my birthright. Just like Lady Gaga, Madonna, Tito Puente, Machido, Duke Ellington, all that is part of our birthright as Americans. We all have different forms of music that we like more than others. But we have so much to savor in this country that most of us never, never get to you know, taste all of the great bounty that we have in terms of culture in this country. The fact that I grew up in the South Bronx and I was exposed to all of that during that time period that was so dark in the history of the city as a testimony to what? The resilience of the people and the resilience of what? Culture. You cannot deny culture. When all of the music programs were cut in the South Bronx, when all of the arts programs, all of the theater programs, all of the dance programs were cut, what happened? No more, no more music programs in the fifth grade when the teacher used to go, all right, these index cards, write down three musical instruments you would like to learn how to play. Those of you who uh, don't uh, want to learn a musical instrument, raise your hands. Okay? You're part of the chorus now. <laughs> Some of you will be part of the theater company at the school, etc., etc. This, this year's play is Macbeth. You know? We're going to learn about Shakespeare. Oh, wait a minute, wait, give me the card back. I'll, I'll play trombone. <laughs> <laughs> All that was cut out, what happens? Hip hop is born. Mm -hmm. They use the technology at hand to make music, et cetera, et cetera. So, you want to help out in terms of, you want to be proactive? Go to GrammyWatch.com, I'm uh, sorry, GrammyWatch.org, sign the petition, and write to Neil Portnow, the president of the Grammys, N E I L, at Grammy.com, and tell them 
listen, what you got, what you did was blasphemous. So whatever you want to do, I'm an American, and as my right, bring back those categories back to the grammars. Because what it is, what they did was just corporate downsizing. They did not ask any of the 21,000 21, members of the grammars in terms of why, hey, we want to cut these categories. You think it's a good idea? No, they did it with a secret subcommittee of 12. It's a 501c6 member organization by California law, even though they're incorporated though. They're supposed to provide us the minutes of any or all minute or any or all meetings, secret or otherwise, and they've denied us. What are they hiding? They're having a protest in front of the Staples Center at the Grammys. Carlos Santana, he put his money with his mouth. It's Carlos Santana, who's got the record for winning most Grammys in a single year, 11, said what they did was racist. And I don't care if they ever invite me back to the Grammys at all. What they did was racist. And it has to, and it's wrong. Herbie Hancock, who used to live right here in the South Bronx, Allison Krauss, Bonnie Raitt, Paul Simon, they've all been on Twitter. Many of you, many of you probably don't know because for whatever reason, you know, most people are not aware of what's happening in, in the world around them. I, tell, I, I read the newspaper every day. I learned that from my father. He told me when I was a kid, if you want to find out what's happening in the world, make sure you read the paper every day. So everybody's busy trying to make a living, trying to, you know, holding two jobs, whatever, or trying to find a job. Okay, and, okay, and let me finish. Let me finish. I know, I know, but let me just finish with this last thing. This is important. You know why? Because it is it. Because when they start taking away your cultural rights, your musical cultural rights, they'll start taking away everything else. So you might think, ah, this is trivial. Believe me, they'll take away everything else. It starts with taking away your culture first. Thanks. And thank you, Bobby. Elena. A postscript to from Mambo to Hip Hop. Uh, what you see now, and, and in light of what Bobby said. Um, well, I think um, I think it's, it's a very relevant issue. I think um, as a folklorist, um, this is not so much in the Bronx. I think in general, um, not only with the Grammys, but um, at the NEA, the National Endowment of the Arts, which a lot of us get funding for a lot of our uh, for art projects, um, they they were going to take away the Jazz Masters Award. Which people like Condi and Ray Barreto, and then Commander Ray Barreto, were got, and they also went to the National um, the um, Heritage Awards um, in, in, in um, the folk artists, and um, which you know people like Edwin Colon Zayas on the Cuatro has gotten different people, so um, different folk artists from around the, um, around the country, and um, but there was again an outcry about that, and um, so they decided not to not to take it away. But I think this is happening all over the place that. The, the arts are very important, and the arts are um, definitely important, and, and there is sort of an attack on the arts in this country right now, the corporatization, the commercialization of a lot of things. So this is, I think, a very important um, issue and a concern for us and, and in the Bronx. I think, you know, it, it's, it's good that we're, you know, there are different um, organizations documented to preserve it, and, and I think that we should keep that going. And just on a little plug, um, if you do want any Christmas presents, I have for Mama Hip Hop for sale. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I need to buy a couple. Oh, by the way, Bobby, I sent you all a Dinka Puente to some, some friends in Europe. And well, I still went to Mesquite. And I suspect that uh, the Peggy Guggenheim Museum uh, gift shop may be ordering. Oh, great. Thank you. So, uh, and Good. I don't have to order it on, on, uh, on eBay or Amazon or what have you. <laughs> and my buddy, you know, there are different, type, there are different types of social cultural activism. Bobby has done an enormous service to all of us, as Al has done a service to all of us. And Al, I've never said this before to you, but you're one of my heroes. So, I respect what you do. Uh, a post note, and I'll tell you, uh, one of my biggest concerns is uh, in the process of doing what I've done, I, I, in the beginning I didn't document stuff, but I started to take a lot of pictures, and I took a, a lot of pictures, and I made a lot of recordings. And so I had a whole bunch of beautiful pictures of a whole bunch of musicians, including Bobby and 
Bang, just a whole bunch. Even Bill, I think I, I got pictures of everything. Oh, I, I have these, these, these three books of pictures. They're beautiful. And, and they sit on my television. And, 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 and so that leads me to concern because I know, I'm sure that you guys have a collection of stuff. And you don't necessarily want to share that with me. Why not? Okay, but 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 yeah, that's but I that promised Nancy some okay. stuff. Okay, they build the heritage center. Right, but that generally that's so generally on the walls of our right. Exactly. No, no, but that's generally what happens is that people don't necessarily want to always share. And I think about it. And I say, if God forbid I'm done tomorrow, those pictures will be under my TV. Those three books of pictures. I know about them. Mike got my name on all these great. I mean, I got pictures of. And Diablo, Mario Hernandez, and I got pictures of so many people, Betty Palmieri, that came to the park. And some fantastic photos that I took with a, a Canon short shot. But I blew them up to eight by 10, and I love to share those, and I just think, well, what happens if I croak? And what happens if the like, kids take the pictures and they say, ah, who the hell is this? I don't know this is. I mean, throw these away, or give them to somebody, or whatever. I can assure you that the Bronx Music Heritage Center will preserve your material. Well, but that, my concern <laughs> is that not only my material, but that for all you that know of people that have these right. collections, right, that right. have all this good stuff, that maybe we all need at some point, and I don't know how to do this, Bill, but maybe you'll think about how to do this, is to get a little bit from everybody and say, hey, Angel, give me a few things, and Bobby, give me a few things, and Al, give me a few things, and we, we, with us giving some of those things up, Man, you know what? Man, we fill a room. We fill ten rooms, man. Yeah, well, other people will know. I don't want the originals. I will no, make, we'll, we'll, we'll make copies to have in our archive because that's important. But that's right. To share that, and that, that's one of my biggest concerns. Is I know people that have DVDs, and I know people that have CDs, and I, I know a whole host of people that have a whole host of collections. And when you talk about kind of wanting to share it, I said, well, what are you going to do with that? What happens if next year you're not here? Who's, who's going to take that? Nobody can answer that question unless you're giving that inheritance to somebody or to a college or to something. That's one of my concerns. And so I need to kind of think about that, how we can all kind of contribute Absolutely. to getting that. A small museum. That's right, baby. At the Bronx Music Heritage Center. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's our plan. Yes, Michael, yeah. how are you going to help us? <laughs> Well, uh, Bill, um, in this spirit of uh, participation and activism, I, I salute you, uh, a warrior for the arts for decades. Bill of Wilder, Bronx Council, and that's the Bronx Council. And you know, that's, that's really, that's, that's the key. I mean, <coughs> we shouldn't just be consumers. Uh, we should make sure we preserve our community voice. This is an era of media consolidation, cuts to the arts. You know, we have to stand up and be active participants. Um, and we are training young people at Bronx Net Media Production High School students right now, youth that are interviewing musicians, or interviewing uh, artists, interviewing community leaders uh, about civic engagement. Um, there's, uh, doing, they're doing a cyber bullying series right now. These are students that uh, want to learn, that are learning media production skills, that are writing, producing, and it's sort of a, a, kind of a natural affinity for this musical element, I think, with the young people, with the youth. Um, so you know, we're forging with the, the Griffin Coalition, a, uh, a, um, a Griffin Youth Leadership Initiative, where we're training young people to produce content to preserve these traditions, including the musical traditions of the Griffin people. And I think an important partner, uh, again, it comes up, is uh, Hosto Center for the Arts and Culture, uh, where through the uh, Rockefeller Innovation Fund, we've partnered with them, and Wallace Edgecombe and um, Jane Gabriels have curated a dynamic uh, program of artists that collaborate, that are innovating, that are using traditional Afro-Caribbean forms and um, on the stages of Hostos, is it possible? Do we have time for one more clip? It's like a minute. What do you think? Do you want one more clip? <laughs> so this is a highlight from a series called Young Roots, um, and we've been uh, really interviewing the artists about the process uh, that are collaborating um, across uh, New York City and, and uh, really uh, uh, going back uh, to the Caribbean. Um, these artists are creating new works on the stages of Hostos. And we've been telling their story, but also documenting fully their performances. And this is just a, uh, a, a short highlight that will you know, show some of the interviews and uh, the process, perhaps. 
uh, uh, you know, folks like Desmar Guevara uh, from uh, Pagones, uh, clean <laughs> <laughs> and um, Sita Fredericks, who's a choreographer uh, of Dominican descent uh, and, and from New York City. Uh, you have also um, Naomi Siguera, who is a Puerto Rican artist. Uh, and these are folks that come to the Bronx that it's sort of a residency. If this is ready, this is, so, you know, that, that's, that are doing an innovative thing. So Zone Del Barrio, uh, uh, working with uh, some young people, Los uh, Montritos, uh, the Little Monsters, uh, and they're playing Latin jazz. They're playing traditional forms. They're uh, creating new music, and it's dynamite. It's electric. It's uh, the, the maestros working with uh, the young people, and it's cross collaboration between dancers. We're gonna have a nice rumba, cha cha cha, guaracha, little bit of mambo, Latin jazz, everything in between, and of course featuring the motrico and their virtuosity. call maybe carnivalesque in the sense that they are street-based forms. This convergence between Gaga and Gloria, these two very African-based music dance traditions were something that started to inspire me and something that I wanted to be a part of in some way. In a nutshell, this project is about the surface of who we are on the outside and the depth of what we are on the inside.
And the best way to help the, the economy is to hire Bronx artists. With that, I thank everybody. Oh, I forgot to Bronx Smith, but I didn't like Bronx Thank you, Bronx Smith. <laughs> I have a question for Bobby. You did the Grammys ever give you a specific outline why they um, pretty much deleted these thirty? Well, they used a lot of excuses that we repudiated right away because we repudiated right away. Firstly, the first thing that they said was that the categories that were cut did not uh, meet the minimum. Did not submit the minimum number of admit uh, of product. To, for the category to exist, the old, the old uh, minimum was tw you had to have 25 submissions from to, for each category to exist. What they conveniently did was also change everything. They said from 25 to 39 submissions now you will only have three nominations in that category. From 40 on up you will have five submissions. That's why there's only three nominees in the salsa category this, this, uh, this period that they just announced the nomination. Now, we found out when I asked the uh, new point now, the meeting we had with them August 11th, they had a damage control meeting. All of a sudden, when the uproar started on August 6th, he flew into Cap to New York to meet with us. That's a whole fiasco, too, because they wouldn't let me, Eddie Palmieri, and a bunch of other people in. They said we didn't answer the RSVP. <laughs> and, we got, and we got the email that said, no RSVP required, so we got, forget it. That was a whole thing. I invited the New York Times, the Daily News, uh, the Wall Street Journal there. They all showed up. They told them, you can't come in because you didn't RSVP. So Larry, Larry Roder from the New York Times said, wait a minute, you're telling me the, that, that, that I work for the biggest paper in the world and you're telling me that I can't come inside to cover this story? Wait till you see what I write tomorrow. <laughs> so they let everybody in. <laughs> so we found out. I asked. I asked. Uh, what was his name? Uh, Bill. Uh, I forgot his name now. But uh, he was there, the vice president of admissions and all that stuff. I go, how many? Cat uh, what's the average for submissions for Latin jazz for the last five years? He goes, thirty-one each year. So why did you cut the category? If the minimum is twenty-five. Oh well. I don't know, but we gotta, you know, it was like, forget it. It's so much jive, it's like, it, this, this, this means that a, like a 60 minutes expo thing. <laughs> they started this, if you go to grammywatch.com, there's a timeline that, it's, uh, that I set up, because I did my own investigate. This started in 2001, when Steely Dan won for best album of the year over Eminem. Eminem's people were mad. How could a band that plays like jazz, rock, oriented music and only sold 50,000 copies not win, uh, win this, this category? Then, what was the year we went to? Herbie Hancock, I was nominated in 2000, I've been nominated five times. 2000, I was nominated for the Latin Jazz Press. So we flew out there in 11. Then it's my partner in life. <laughs> to be for full disclosure. So, <laughs> Herbie, Hancock, Herbie Hancock wins for record of album of the year over Kanye West, over Amy Winehouse. Kanye West people, we were looking down like, oh, look, they, they exploded. They were like, oh, what the F? You know, like, you know. So, Herbie Hancock gets up there, takes a credit, he goes, I don't know what's happening, but it's a change. People are recognizing good music, finally, you know. <laughs> <laughs> So, remember what he said? And then last year, when that happened, they formed that secret subcommittee. And they met for 18 mm -hmm. months. And that's for the final blow was when Esperanza Spalding won for Best New Artist. A woman who had only sold 15,000 units over just in people who had sold millions. Mm -hmm. Steven Stout, a few days later, who's his public, who is PR, his PR person, does PR for Jay-Z, does PR for Lady Gaga, and Madonna, <laughs> took out a full page ad in the New York Times, forty thousand dollars, saying the Grammys are out of touch. How dare they give it, the Grammy to a woman who only sold fifteen thousand units? Nobody knows, insulting her and everything. People hijacked her website. 
or I checked her Wikipedia page, started writing these foul things, all the Justin Bieber things. It's, instead of our president, Neil Portnow, having a press conference, we want to remind everyone that the Grammys are voted on by the 20,000 members of the Academy. It's a member-based award, and we celebrate excellence, like Frank Sinatra said in the first Grammys in 1959. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, it's about excellence, not about popularity. The American Music Awards, Country Music Awards, are all about popularity. The, the Naris Grammys are about excellence, and that's why Esperanza won. We voted for her. She's an incredible bass player, incredible vocalist. The album was like the, the greatest thing, you know. You know. So when we all we were all happy in the jazz community, and then all of a sudden, August 6, boom, the hatchet came down. Now you'll never see another person like Esperanza Spalding winning again that category, best new artist. There was like an uproar, that was like, like Kanye West flip. You know, if you think he went flipped over, what was that country? Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift. <laughs> Taylor Swift. Yeah. You know, she, you know, and I know because uh, uh, Taylor Swift's drama study with me. He goes, I said, what happened when, when that happened? He goes, oh man, forget it, Kanye West, he was like cursing, he was like, mm -hmm. all his people, <clears throat> you know? Now in defense, playing devil's advocate for Steven Stott, He's very honest. He says, listen, if my artist sells so many millions of records like Jay-Z, then he should win the damn Grammy if he's in that category, because he's, he's, he's sold so many uh, units. He's about all about the bling. Nothing wrong with that, because he's honest about it. It's about, you know, but that's not what the Academy is about. The Academy is about nurturing, celebrating, and propagating all forms of American music. By them cutting all these categories, they're saying, we don't care about cultural diversity mm -hmm. anymore mm -hmm. in the Grammys. They said, the other speech, they said, well, the Grammy show is too long. None of those 30 <coughs> categories ever appears on the show. <laughs> they always appear at the three hour pre telecast that we were at, remember? That, that you know, they, they and, and it's great because you get the recognition. Uh, that means 155 artists will never be, have the chance to say they were, they were nominated for the Grammys, get the Grammy bump in sales get more gigs because you get a Grammy nomination. Um, 55 won't get gra uh, the Grammy. All the related industries, uh, journalism, people that cover these categories, uh, mastering engineers, recording engineers, uh, publicity people, all of there's about 3,000 people affected by this in terms of the industry. So you have to go to GrammyWatch.com, sign the petition, and write to them for them. Well, you know, and sorry for taking so long, but you did answer. Yeah. <laughs> Thank Anybody? you. Anybody else? Comments? Okay. Nobody has any, but you can ask the angel where you got this time. <laughs> Men's warehouse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not the same time. Being the oldest one here, my era was the happy days era. Well, from 1950 to 51 to 1969, 1970. I worked as a musician. That's it. I made her money. <coughs> but uh, these guys, just like that, they get your time. No, no, no. They get nothing. All right. What I'm trying to point out is. That being in this early era, I had it made. Those were the easy days in music because there was the move from rumba to mambo. I was a rumba musician. But they had it hard. They came in the middle 60s, just like Bobby said, the tough days. Angel, hey, they had it hard. I had it easy. So I'm here just to put a stamp on what they say. Their observation and their living through it is on point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. a great historian, a documentarian, a, 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 somebody who's done a lot to document this music, preserve it. Also, the, the, immigrant, the migration movement of Puerto Ricans to the United States. And he's also part, one of the main movers and shakers in getting. Arsenio Rodriguez, who lived in the Bronx, also the father of what we call modern contemporary salsa today, Cuban-based music as we do it in New York, 
our Senor Rodriguez. Without him, we wouldn't be doing anything. He lived in the Bronx on Prospect Avenue. Um, Rafael Mendez, who's been, who got, finally got a, has been able to secure a gravestone for our Senor Rodriguez. Oh, I was in the process of securing a gravestone for our Senor Rodriguez after all these years. If I can comment on that. Uh, it's interesting because the title here is called El Elemental de Bronx. That's like one of the words that comes from the song. Uh, one of the songs that he wrote, A La Gente de Bronx. Uh, I don't know if many people are aware, but Arsenio is buried in Hartsdale, New York, in an uh, well, it's not that it's not marked. It doesn't have a grave memorial. We found out about that, and we thought that was pretty, you know, not fair. Uh, this past August was his 100th anniversary of his birth. Uh, a couple of us got together, and we went up there. Chocolate uh, was up there, uh, along with Nene Lopez, and uh, a couple other people to pay homage for his 100th birthday. Uh, the next thing we wanted to do was we found out, we asked why he doesn't have a gravestone. Uh, they couldn't give us an answer. Uh, what we did was did research. I said, well, what if we got money up and put it ourselves? Oh, the cemetery said, no, because uh, you have to get permission from the estate to put it in. So who, I got the information, and we found out that Arsenio had a widow. Okay. Nobody could find the widow. Make a long story longer, we were able to get a, uh, through the New York Times and a recent article in the Daily News, the family members contacted us. We now have written permission to put a gravestone, a grave memorial at his stone, uh, at his uh, burial site. The cost is only $2,100, approximately top. Uh, I already secured the rights, uh, uh, the fee, I already paid for the fee. We're going to be setting up a, sun, a fundraiser very shortly, uh, so we can come up. Uh, Larry Harlow was there, he's involved with this also. Uh, so we're, we're at the 10-yard uh, yard line. We want to go in for the touchdown now. But the second part is, I send you a lift here in the Bronx, dedicated a song to the Bronx. A lot of people are not aware of it. Nothing's ever been done for him. We think it's about time that maybe a street, he lived all over the Bronx, uh, a street be named for him, or a park, or some, some sort of uh, uh, public venue that, that bears his name, because uh, there's no side cell without our city. And uh, so, uh, the building. Well, we like to make a street, so uh, we're, we need help, and uh, I'm only one guy, and I'm doing, the, I'm, I'm basically a researcher collector. Uh, we'll talk. And uh, so, I, I, I ask for your help. Thank you. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I had a question, though. No comment. I can't hear you. So I, I know you guys are talking about a lot of this stuff, but um, being that you got to talk about Arsenio and being the father of what we call South Sound and we're doing all that, is there possible that you guys are going to do that when you guys see up uh, in the future, like uh, Allegre Records, which was in Southern Boulevard, being that that was a historical monument as well? Will that be like something in the thing? Because a lot of folks don't talk about Allegre and Tico and Coteek Records. And well, then I can answer that. Well, I think, like Arsenio, Al Santiago is one of those people in, in the Bronx that um, is really under-recognized. Yeah. And, um, you know, if, it, if there wasn't an Al Santiago and an Alegre, there'd probably be no Fania. And, um, and I'm sure a lot of these musicians here, Benny, Orlando Marin, I know, recorded with Al Santiago early. Cas Mike Gamaleo got to start working for Al Santiago at Casa Alegre. And, um, so, yeah, it's very important, but there's all these important people like that um, that are so under-recognized under for their contributions, like Arsenio, like Al Santiago. And, um, you know, we've tried to, um, you know, document. There is some documentation here and there. Um, the book South Theology, I don't know if that's in print anymore, by Bernard Boggs is a really great long interview with Al Santiago. So there is some information here and there. Um, about him, but um, yeah, I mean that, that's just one of the other places. There's I mean, so many other um, musicians. You guys can probably all talk about that. That's that leads to that plaque. Oh well. That, 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 that's, uh, 
Tell them about that. Well, I mentioned it earlier. On, on, you know, Casa Alegre was right across the street. It's actually funny. It was right across the street, sort of, from Casa, where Casa Madeira was now. So that whole area was just full of um, places. I guess, you know, there's subways there. It's a major intersection. It's a place where people went. So um, you have that area, Clococano, PS52 was there, um, Prospect Theater, Casa Alegre, Casa, Casa um, Amadeo. And then this new building went up and put a plaque and talked about all the contributions to R&B and jazz from that neighborhood. And at the very end, they're like, oh yeah, and Tito Rodriguez and Celia Cruz made Latin music in, from this neighborhood. And it's like, well, this is the heart of what, what, what a lot was going on in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And it's that footnote. We talked about that, us being a footnote in, in the history all the time. And I think, um, and Mike's really upset. Mike uh, Amadeo was actually really upset by that plaque. Has he talked to you about that? Yeah. He goes, we're right next, he's right next door to the store founded by Rafael Hernandez. And Rafael Hernandez is not even mentioned. And Rafa, Rafael Hernandez is the most famous composer throughout Latin America. And his sister started that store, you know, and, and, um, and, and all the history that it has. So it's, it's very insulting. And it, you know the the the, the might I know among other people want to be able to maybe talk to the guy and take it down or fix it or something I don't know if that'll happen but that could be another cause that that needs to be done but you know it, it, our history tends to be hidden and um, and you know it, it comes out too um, my, Max has been talking about the Garifuna community a lot that is a, there's growing communities this, the Bronx has always been considered a very Puerto Rican community um, neighborhoods, but it's, there are all different Mexican communities growing, and the Garifuna community is growing, and it's a very hidden community as well, and um, you know, one thing I found out, which I was told, when I found this out, I was totally shocked, I didn't know, the Happy Land Fire, you guys all know about the Happy Land Fire, was that the 80s? Mm -hmm. and, and 1990. 1990. 1990 um, when there was, I always knew it was the Honduran community, oh, member, many members of the Honduran, but actually most of them were from the Garifuna. Under a community, and, I, and again, it's just this like invisible community. It's another instance where it's, it, communities just are unrecognized, and um, so um, yeah, I mean that, that's why this, this documentation is so is so important. But and, and and work, you know, people like our senior are in the past, but we need to have the past to build on. Even though as we are getting new communities doing new forms of music, the Dominic, Dominican styles of music, Mexican styles of music. You know, got for now. So um, we have to build the balance of the history of what was there and what's coming in now. It's important that you, you know, like that thing is so insulting. That plaque. Mm -hmm. Now, who knows how much it costs? It's, it's like uh, ran out of metal and iron or whatever. It's probably like something that costs like five thousand dollars. So uh, I, when we were talking about, I go, man, you know. They're going to have to recast another thing, you know, whatever. But it's worth it that we fight because it's just totally insulting, man. Oh. That we're trivialized like that. And if you got, you don't say anything, if, you know, like some people talk to me all day, hey, Bobby, you're going to be mad about this. Listen, man, if I don't get mad, who's going to get mad? If people insult you and you, like, constantly take it or don't recognize what you've done in your community, you know, what your people have done, or just the community in general, yeah. then what are you worth? There's kids now, 15 years old, 16 years old, Puerto Rican, walking down the street in the Bronx, in Manhattan, in Brooklyn, Staten Island, Queens, clueless, they, they don't know, Tito Puente? Who's Tito Puente? What? You know? I mean, that, that and what does that say about us? So, if we don't fight, and, and you know, I respect Mark Mason, I'm one of his fans. But he was responsible for that plaque and for him to trivialize us. I, I, in, in his defense, I think he, from what I heard, he, he just gave the information and the building owners, the management did their own thing. Yeah, but they did their own thing. It's still not right. right. It's still not right. right. I agree with Bobby on this. You know, you don't put your name to something like that and, and, and not respect what the community is. And if you just look around, you don't have to be a PhD to recognize what the community is all about. You know, and on the corner there, what happened, Mike's place, come on, you know? It was it was an insult to us, and it's still an insult to us. And, you know, I mean, I worked with Mark, and, uh, you know, and I'm not embarrassed to say that, you know, I think he sold us out. But I think that happened, that's a very local example of that, but you can, Rafael Hernandez again comes up, um, I think it's a very important thing. Might, people might have talked about it a lot, but I think it's very important. Ken Burns' jazz documentary, 
um, which came out a few years ago, Ken Burns gets millions of dollars in funding, tells the stories of the Harlem Hellfighters, and um, a very interesting story, amazing story, the World War I military band that brings jazz to Europe. Not once does he mention that a third of the band were Puerto Ricans, or black Puerto Ricans, and it was a, that's how Rafael Hernandez came to New York, to live in New York, and that's never mentioned. Yeah, he went to Puerto Rico to recruit them. Yeah. To recruit them, and, and so Puerto Ricans, Afro-Puerto Ricans were part of the band that brought jazz to Europe. So, so Puerto Ricans have been this very important part of jazz since, the, since at least before, when we have you know, documented since World War I. So, and you know, again, it's, it's our history, and, and you know, someone like Rafael Hernandez, who was so important, and who has a very big legacy in the Bronx, is always, um, is always, you know, in, invisible. The problem is that in this country, things are tend to look bad in just two colors, black and white, and Latinos are the big pink elephant in the room. We like the pink elephant in the room, the black guy, the white guy is there, there's a big pink elephant, the black guy goes to the white guy, hey, you see that big pink elephant over there? They go, nah, I don't see anything, man. He goes, man, he's got a big conga drum now between his legs and he's playing the hell out of it. You hear, don't you hear that? I don't hear nothing and I don't see nothing. And the black guy goes to the white guy, or vice versa. Well, if you don't see nothing, and I don't hear nothing, then there must there's nothing there. So we, the, you guys, the spirit of activism, like Rafa, like Rafi, just he loves our Senor Rodriguez. And it's like he feels, man, it's unjust that this incredible man has no gravestone. You know, I mean, you know, it's not like Frank Zappa that he's buried in, in Hollywood, the uh, High Hill Cemetery. He didn't want a gravestone. Yeah. No, he doesn't. He doesn't have one. He didn't want one. He didn't, you know, That's no but problem. people still go there. Yeah, you know, this guy, this guy doesn't have anything. You know, so it's so Ralph should do that. Is now, just, uh, just pass me the number and we'll take care. We we'll have no problem with fixing that. He's <laughs> the flat. There's another one for you. How come Duke Ellington's statue is on 110th Street and 5th Avenue? Duke Ellington never lived there, nothing. And that's the heart of Spanish, of what is known as locally as Spanish heart. Meanwhile, there's no statue of Tito Puente, Machito, or Tito Rodriguez, our three kings. You know, what's, what's that about? How about Norman Morales? Well, you can name a whole bunch of but at least there should be a statue, at least, at the very minimum, of Machito there. But it's right where the Park Palace okay. ballroom is. What I like to do is, uh, we, we're going to have to cut it. Yeah. And my thing for doing this is that, you know, that I'm, I'm breaching my contract. <laughs> so, he yeah, has a new swing for me. I want to thank everybody. Okay.